Brilliant. Got it? Fantastic. All right, guys, thank you very much for your grace there. Shell, hello, welcome. It's good to have you. Karen, it's good to have you. Matthew's here as well. We've got a number of people watching us live on Facebook as well, but since you're here in the Zoom, it's an opportunity to post questions or bring comments. Guys, this is a lesson from the Sovereign Way to help shed light, disarm, and disperse the frequencies that catch our attention and draw our awareness away from truth, away from love, and into the agony of doubt, anxiety, hesitation, procrastination, codependency and terror, stagnation and self-pity. You know exactly the frequencies that I'm talking about because they haunt you as they haunt us all in our daily dance with life. It's actually easier than we think to dispel falsehood from our vibrational reality. And that is always what awareness does, what sovereign does. All healing comes from love and loving awareness is the fastest way to heal consciousness. Those are the frequencies that we're talking about today. We're talking about the difference between truth and falsehood as it emerges in consciousness. Now, if you get good at discerning the difference between truth and falsehood, you can quickly recognize opportunities to serve and expand, and you'll recognize the call into joy and prosperity, and you'll easily grow your legacy of impact and see the fruit of your life. But if you don't get good at this or enhance your ability to discern as you yourself expand in your consciousness, then at any level of awareness, you can be easily seduced into judgment and bitterness, regret and stagnation, anxiety and despair. You'll find yourself engaged in discourse about matters that don't matter and your creative energy will be consumed by the by the efforts to stay buoyant in a turbulent world that always has some resistance to the expansion that you're attempting to engage with. We're growing into and through a truth expansion, guys. All energies are magnified at the moment. So you need to get good at this discernment now. Now is the time. But don't worry. Like I said, it's easier than we think to navigate the difference between truth and falsehood. And this class is gonna give you some extra clarity and with clarity comes power. So are you ready? Have you got your pens and paper and your glasses of water at the ready? Great. Guys, this isn't a teaching about what out there is good and what out there is evil and how you find out which report to believe or which article to believe or which food to eat or which food to avoid. That's not what this is about at all. It's not about what's out there. Falsehood does live in the structure. It does abide in the collective and it does live in the body. But deeper than that, it is in the air. Let's look at Genesis 3. I'm not going to read the whole chapter, but I'll give you the synthesis. This is what went down, right? God formed the Garden of Eden, a field of potential abundance, of, of abundant potentiality. And he placed the human consciousness in dominion and stewardship of that abundant creative possibility. We are made in the image. And in that field of creative possibility was the serpent. And remember, that means the snake was already there. The human didn't invent it. It is an idea in the mind of God, which means that it has a purpose and it has a place. Genesis 3.1 says the snake was more subtle than the wild animals that God had made. Subtle not a manifest beast, not a manifest creature with horns and a pitchfork, but a subtle frequency. Now, the directive that we were given in the garden, it's in Genesis, is to uphold and nurture what is good and true. So that's our first directive. That's what's closest to our heart, what's closest to our core purpose, is to uphold and nurture what is good and true. And we were instructed right, instructed by prime directive, by design, not to eat, embody 
the knowing of good and evil, because we will surely die a spiritual death of declining awareness, a sense of separation from wholeness. So we are instead to choose to embody all things that are good. That means that we do know in our hearts what is true. That's what we have first and foremost. Notice in Genesis 3.1 that falsehood doesn't tell the human mind what to do. It simply questions. Really? Did God really say that? God knows you won't die if you eat the apple. The frequency of evil doesn't oppose truth. It takes truth and twists it and then introduces doubt and seduces your awareness by offering all sorts of egoic benefits. If you eat the truth, if you eat the fruit, you'll be like a god. That's what it says. So this is how it works with our awareness, not opposing truth, because that would offer um, easily identifiable resistance, but instead it twists the truth and seduces our awareness. Here's the antidote written in Genesis 3.1. Uh, sorry, 3.11. When the human mind repeats the lie, truth asks, who told you that? Who told you that? So ask yourself, who said that? Where is this idea coming from? Is this truth? Or is this story that I've heard from somewhere? And that question invites your loving awareness to dispel falsehood quickly and easily. That simple question, it doesn't matter where you think you are in your awareness or in your maturity, in your spiritual maturity, that question is always pertinent. Every moment that you sense a, a decline in spiritual awareness or you, descent, you sense a weakening um, of your spiritual energy, you're in the presence of falsehood. So be diligent in asking yourself, who said that? Who is that? Evil does have a purpose, you see. It is a coding to keep our awareness on illusion. If Christ is a state of consciousness that is fully remembered and realized divine, then antichrist is the opposite, fully separate and voided illusion, notness, the opposite of isness. Let's look at the sovereign model of human consciousness to see how this lands in the relationship between consciousness, energy, and manifestation. This is a good time to get your pens and papers out. This is a linear way of arranging our understanding of the relationship between consciousness, energy, and manifest form. We say, we all agree, you and I and everyone else agrees that we come from one source. There is one source and one substance and one supply of all things. And I'll represent that here as a field of truth. I'm going to call it God. And we know that if God is all the knowing and all the love and all the awareness, then there's a very specific strand of that, which is uniquely your awareness. So you're drawn out. This is, this is creative life force. This is that which creates right here, that essence. And that is essentially what you're made of. And so because the human consciousness has in it, the ability to know the difference between good and falsehood, the, the ability, uh, the embodied knowing of evil, then it means that we refract all potentiality into variety. We create judgments, we claim things, we make facts and matters, and we call them more true or less true. Just the same way as sunlight is refracted in a prism, it becomes a rainbow of variety that's projected through our energy field. And we do know, we do understand that consciousness impresses energy and energy impresses form, which means that our life's experience matches um, the, the ideals that we hold in our consciousness. Look, here's a lie that says, I'm not worthy. And here's another lie that says, you're not worthy. And what we tend to see in life, therefore, is that it arranges itself in accordance with the rules and decrees that we hold to be true in our consciousness. 
Now, I had a client who had been to 47 different doctors looking for the answer to her mystery illnesses that were manifesting as burning symptoms. It didn't take us long. Uh, after 47 doctors who had not been able to understand what the relationship was between the symptoms and, and the root cause, it didn't take us long through the I Am Truth program uh, with Sovereign to unwrap the fact that installed in her consciousness from an early age was the belief in condemnation, the belief in eternal damnation, eternal suffering in hell. And she had been brought up in a very distrusting and skeptical culture where she had been trained to look for the frequencies of evil. That's not discernment, that's seeking it out. And sure enough, because written in her consciousness was, they are out to get me and uh, I will burn in hell forever if I get this wrong. The manifest result was that she was always around in her experience. She was always around the frequency of evil. She was always under attack from potential suffering and eternal damnation. And the, the way the body was manifesting that was as intense burning symptoms in her body. So this is the relationship between what we hold to be true in our consciousness, the embodied knowing of good and evil, and how that manifests through energy and into form. So we can see why we're encoded with the directive to embody only what is good and true. That's the first directive in the Garden of Eden. We can see why we're told only hold what is good and true. Do not eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Only choose to know what is true. And it also shows us then why in Genesis 3.15, God goes on to list the consequences of holding a frame of consciousness which knows evil. God goes on to say, well, this is what's going to happen as a result. Now that you've chosen to embody that knowing, all of these things are going to happen to you. It's not punishment. It's just energy. According to the Christian cosmology, we can categorize evil in three ways. Number one, sin of the flesh. That's our personal sin. This is our shadow. These are the thoughts and the feelings and the actions on an individual level that counter alignment with truth and that deny or diminish the experience of love. Number two, the sin of the world. These are the structures and the systems of economy, of politics and whatnot that serve to glorify the ego, the corporate systemic systems of illusion and manipulation that inform our choices when we're not aware like culturally agreed upon limitations and exclusions, tracks of evil that we unconsciously whiz along on. And we all agree upon them and they all seem to be very good because they seem to serve, but in a very limited and egoic way. And then level three, the unique, mysterious field of consciousness called Satan which is this fundamental, subtle coding of illusion and deceit. That's the subtle serpent in the garden, an innate frequency that dominates the very air that we breathe, as the spiritual teacher Paul wrote in Ephesians. And it's a part of the fabric of creation, just like grace, just like abundance, just like joy, i.e. the snake was already there in the garden. I'm going to read a short passage from the book, What Do We Do About Evil? This is the book. It's by Richard Raw. He was a Catholic priest, a mystic, one of my favorites. And this is a very short, easy to read book called What Do We Do About Evil? I recommend it. So remember, these are the three um, delineated layers of falsehood according to this Christian cosmology. And I think you'll find that it definitely runs true. And um, proceeding, uh, proceeding from that, he writes, since the unconsciousness or deadness proceeds from at least three sources, this makes it very hard to place blame precisely and appropriately, which is why we all long to scapegoat because it takes away our anxiety when we think we have localized evil. Law cannot fully locate it, witness our unhappiness with so many legal verdicts, nor can the individualized conscience 
nor can some perfect social analysis, because there's always another cause too. This is how subtle the frequency of falsehood is. In other words, falsehood can't be found out here as a manifestation of your fault and your error. That's not where it lives. Falsehood is in the very air. Now, what of its function? How does it do it? Let me show you the Hawkins scale. This is the scale of consciousness that was derived or designed by Dr. David Hawkins and his team of tens of thousands of kinesiologists in a very robust way. They discovered that you can unravel um, the, the calibration of truth in any human and any uh, system and in any religion and in any political ideology. You can calibrate the level of truth in it and you can place it on a scale from complete notness, which is this complete void of spiritual separation, all the way up to total remembered, recognized, embodied divine being. And um, as we can see on this, on this scale of consciousness, there are two particular dynamics. One is as consciousness um, embodies more truth and more love, there is an upward motion, which we call ascension. And in the opposite, there is a downward motion, which we call entropy. So it makes a lot of sense then that there are frequencies of good that serve to elevate and enhance our awareness. And there are frequencies of evil that serve to depress and diminish our awareness. That makes sense. So when we're in the presence of truth, we experience this elevation, enlightenment, enhancement. And this is what we call ascension in consciousness. And when we're in the presence of falsehood, we experience depression, spiritual decline, and entropy. This is the first and most powerful piece of awareness for you to begin your practice of discerning the difference between truth and falsehood. Understand that truth equals elevation and power and strength, and falsehood equals depression, decline, and weakness. Truth is strength, falsehood is weakness. We can actually measure this scientifically using the subtle energy systems in our bodies. There are millions of ways to do this, and you can yourself develop the skill of kinesiology, which allows you to use your own muscles to calibrate the level of truth in anything, in the food that you're about to eat, in an idea that someone has presented to you, in a vision that you have developed for yourself, in a friendship, in a relationship, in, a, in, a, in your purpose and place. And when you have um, the ability to discern the level of truth and falsehood in any given field of consciousness, you also have the ability to calibrate it up. You have the ability to transmute and improve and enhance. Now look, for levels of consciousness below 200, 200 is neutrality. At the level of 200, your consciousness is like, yeah, you win some, you lose some. Life is life, I guess, in neutrality. And in levels below 200, it's very easy for the frequencies of evil to deceive your awareness because the human awareness is in illusion already. So your, uh, your perspective, your perception, your, your framework of, of viewing the world through is already in the coding of illusion. So it is in Satan. You understand that? So all evil needs to do is to keep you there. So lies like you are worthless or he is worthless, they have a lot of impact in this particular field below 200 and they're extremely effective. But for higher levels of awareness of consciousness, other mechanisms of falsehood are necessary because the lie you're worthless has no power over you because your knowing I am worthy is so much more powerful than the lie. It might sting a little to hear it, but that's how you discern it as evil because you can discern the depressing effect. So instead, falsehood arranges itself intelligently into other systems. 
For example, in the mid layers of consciousness around 500, below 500, populated by highly intelligent, highly powerful, highly purposeful, purposeful uh, individuals and collectives, the frequencies of seduction and manipulation work very well. But addiction can reach even beyond that because it uses your own biochemistry to distract you from truth. Think about that. And you're all like, oh, but I'm so very, very ascended. I'm so ascended. Evil has no power over me. Really? That's how it works. So the, the, uh, I'm going to give you some, um, some easy tools to begin to feel the difference. Ah, there's, there's a little um, obstacle there. Feel the difference. Discern the difference. If you're going to try to feel the difference between truth and falsehood, you need to sort out whether what you're discerning is an arising emotion, right? Whether it is an emotion, which is a, 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 a biological response to something external, or whether it is a feeling, which is a spiritual response to something internal, or whether it is a sensation, which is a physical response to something external. Am I sensing an evil frequency? Am I feeling the rise of a negative emotion, like wrath or like greed? Or am I feeling uh, uh, a frequency of falsehood. Like I'm feeling diminished. I'm feeling sad. You need to sort out those three um, aspects of what feeling is. Feeling, we use that word feeling, but it means three different things. It means emotion, emoting, spiritual feeling, individual feeling, and sensing your visceral sensory perception. So knowing that, keep that in mind as I give you these seven frequencies to be aware of. These are the seven deadly sins which were collected by Pope Gregory. When you know them and you define them, you've got a pretty good exercise to help us notice to what degree we've slipped into entropy, right? We're, we are always exposed to these frequencies, some more than others. And if we can notice the, the rising of these frequencies in ourselves, then we can see to what level we've slipped into entropy, right? Towards evil, retracting, not expanding, causing vibrational harm. Do you understand that? Because we are entangled energetically with all things. So our depression causes a collective depression. Just as if we had a tapestry suspended and we, put, we, we place a weight in one individual point to cause a depression, the entire tapestry is lowered a little bit. Listen to these frequencies and see which ones you can recognize. Challenge yourself to be outrageously, courageously honest with yourself about which of these frequencies play havoc with your ability to discern truth in any given moment. Number one, pride the inflation or wounding of my worldly ego. Or lust, doing anything at all for the sake of carnal pleasure instead of love. It poses as spiritual pleasure. Lust poses as spiritual pleasure. Oh, I'm just being in my abundance. Then there's gluttony, the constant needing more and more. You know, I need more and more from out there somewhere. I need it from out here. Validation, food, attention, sensation, excitement. I need more and more. It's never enough. It's not fulfilling me. Or envy. It's double-edged. Envy is both wanting what you have and also not wanting you to have it. It poses as righteous judgment. It does. It poses as righteous judgment. Oh, she just manifested that all so quick. It's going to come crashing down. I'm sure of it. She's, she's doing so well for herself, she must be manipulating, whatever it might be. Or greed, collecting more and more for the sake of just having it, not for enjoying it, not for the, not for the purpose of experiencing the abundance of the kingdom, but just for the having of it. And it poses as abundance mindset. Or sloth, not participating with the flow of creation for the avoidance of the experience of effort. 
it shouldn't take effort. It should be graceful and easy. I want everything to come with grace and ease, not effort and works. It poses as flow state. I just wasn't called to it. It doesn't resonate with me right now. Do you know how long I put off my tax returns every year because it doesn't resonate with me right now? <laughs> so you see, you can't really win over evil. None of us can because it's a part of the human design. It's a part of the human consciousness. In the very, very, very early days of the conception of the idea of human, there was the choice to embody the knowing of good and evil. So it is innate. It's innate in us, this, this knowing of this subtle frequency. So we can't win over it. We'll always be receptive to evil because there is always the chance that you'll forget, even for a nanosecond, that there's a third force at play, which is grace. Grace trumps all the laws of physics and metaphysics. And it is embedded in your being. And it is infinitely abundant in that place of sovereign poise before you've made a declaration of whether the facts of the matter are good or bad. You can stand face to face with the personification of Satan and know that you are Christ. <laughs> Goes evil in the face of truth. So while you can't really ever beat the counterforce that is evil, you can learn the mastery of aligning yourself with grace, of aligning your field of consciousness with a field of consciousness that is purely graceful. And that allows you to master how you dance with that evil resistance, with that encoded embedded frequency that serves to keep your attention on illusion and not on truth. And if you can learn how to dance with it, how to navigate it in the turbulence of the world, you'll be able to meet your relationships with much less vulnerability to trigger. And knowing these frequencies as they arise in you will help you discern whether the pull that you're feeling is truth or a story, it will give you broader and deeper awareness of truth and it will improve and enhance your worldly mission. You'll become a better coach, a better therapist, a better influencer, a better mum or dad. It'll prepare you to only know love, to know more and more love. And more and more is the nature of the universe. Better and better is the nature of experience. Deeper and deeper into God is the truly mystical nature of your life reawakened inside the body of Christ. The ripple effects are beyond measure. But to su suffice to say, you can expect a life of ever increasing magic and miracle. By the way, when you do spiritual work, it is important to have a guide who can help you hold a weight of consciousness while you explore, especially when you're doing spiritual and energetic study because of the nature of where you're placing your focus. So if you're going scuba diving, for example, you need the right equipment and you need a dive master because otherwise your shadow work or your attempts to seek out and discern the frequencies of flaw and evil can go on forever because your focus magnifies the experience of it and things seem like a bigger deal than they really are. You end up adjusting your frame of vision. Remember my story about my client who after 47 doctors figured out that the reason her symptoms were so hell-like was because she had created a frame of consciousness where that was the experience she was going to have. So you don't want to create and adjust your frame of vision to correspond with darkness and trauma and error and falsehood because you will find those things and they will magnify in your experience. 
You can cause an innocent memory to be remembered into your innate consciousness as a terrible thing when it wasn't. So these things need to be done delicately and with a great amount of discernment and wisdom and vibrational buoyancy. That's why we're opening up a three-month coaching program for consciousness clearing, mental and vibrational mastery, and spiritual ascension. You will be trained in discernment. You'll learn how to hold excellent vibrational buoyancy, and you'll discover direction and power that you never knew that you had. But it might not be for you because we're, we are only looking for committed truth seekers, you who know that you are called to be a part of bringing about the kingdom. You who know that you aren't afraid of ruffling some feathers and dissolving some belief systems. And if this isn't you, then that's okay. There's definitely a program out there for you. But if this is you, if you are ready to do a beautiful, profound, and deeply empowering three-month coaching program with some of the best vibrational ontologists on the planet, then let us know. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's a quote from Philippians 4.8. And isn't it lovely? Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent and praiseworthy, dwell on those things and see the consequences in your life expand. Thank you ever so much for coming for this quick and brief teaching from the Sovereign Way. I hope it has given you some clarity and some empowerment to continue your dance with the discernment between truth and falsehood. And don't forget to reach out to us. Now that you know that this coaching program is for you, you know where to find us. Thank you ever so much, everybody. Are there any questions? We have one from the crowd. Karen, go ahead. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, you were mentioning kinesiology uh, to uh, get a sense of what are what feels right. Um, how do you do that? Do you, I know like you can stand and uh, ask. Um, well, I'll just ask you how, how, what's your way of utilizing the kinesiology to find a more truthful answer? Good, good question. Thank you for asking that. Kinesiology is based on strength and weakness. And it is, it is based on the knowing that your muscles, your cellular consciousness responds to the amount of power that it has access to at any given time. When you're in the presence of falsehood, there is a weakness. And when you're in the presence of truth, there is a strength. Now, it is important to know that uh, it, it's not as simple as black and white, because it also depends a lot on your ability to calibrate into truth in any given moment. Let's say you're standing in falsehood and you're trying to me measure whether you should eat another apple or not then you may get a false, a false answer. So it's important to, to develop the ability to first calibrate yourself into truth before you use this. But there are, like you said, there are many ways. You can, there are lots of people who do like the arm testing. You can do the standing and either you, you move forward or back depending on how your body responds. Personally, I use a very simple strength test using, using two fingers together. That's how. So you can develop this skill, but I would say it's important to do that with a practitioner who's already practiced because that's how you can that's how you can tell whether your measurements are accurate or whether they are under the influence as well. Brilliant. Thank you, Karen. Are there others? No, well, guys, thank you ever so much for coming. If you do have questions, you can you know where to send them, pop them in the Sovereign Way group and uh, one of our practitioners will get back to you. Thank you for coming, everybody. The replay will be posted. Have a great day. God bless you all.